Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever been told anything you wanted to achieve was impossible, whether your health, wealth, career, family, sports, business, arts, or otherwise, then do we have the one in a million show for you. Today I'll be talking with Aaron Baker, a true hero of mine, who also happens to be one of the most able-bodied, recovering quadriplegic athletes, business owners, and inspiring people out there. Since his injury, he's walked 20 miles across Death Valley, ridden his bike not once, but twice across the country, go-karted, mountain biked, and does more in a day that doctors say was impossible than most people do in a lifetime. And that's what I want to talk with him about today, about believing in yourself no matter what the experts tell you to achieve the impossible or at least give it your best shot. We'll talk about getting started, overcoming odds, and going after your dreams like there's no tomorrow. That plus we'll talk about pink training wheels, mountain biking mammoth, go-karts and Red Bull, and why having your toenails painted all the colors of the rainbow just may be the greatest gift in the world. (laughs) So welcome to the show, Aaron. Are you ready to shine? Yes. Thank you, Michael. Woohoo! Well, thank you so much for being on the show. Before we dive right into things, I've got to ask, can you tell me about Christmas Day when you were three years old? <laughs> that was the best day in the world at that point. Woohoo! I, I, yeah. I remember uh, I was at my grandparents' house, and I was on the second story at the top of the stairs, and I looked down, and in front of the fireplace was sitting a brand new Pee Wee motorcycle. And I don't even think I hit the steps. I flew from the top to the to the bottom and threw my leg over that thing, and the rest is history. How long were the pink training wheels on for? Uh, that afternoon. <laughs> but I actually learned how to ride that little motorcycle at three years old before I learned to pedal a bicycle. Wow, that should say something. So, what was it? What did it feel like then when you were, in, and how old were you when you won your first race? I believe I was about five years old. Mm-hmm. Um, Just leading the pack, um, you know, twisting that throttle, and uh, I just felt so in control, uh, Mm -hmm. so liberated. Just there was nothing that could compare to that little motorcycle and winning a race, a trophy that was taller than me. I mean, doesn't get better than that at that point. Very cool. And then fast forwarding, I don't know, how old were you? Fifteen or so when you won your first nationals? I was sixteen. Yes, I won my first amateur national championship. Uh, I, I won a handful of those. It was uh, the stepping stones to a professional career. Mm-hmm. So I was well on my way. How did you feel when you won it and, and what was going on in your psyche at the time? It's a pretty special place uh, to be in uh, knowing that you're the best in the world at that level. Mm-hmm. The confidence. Because you did. You, you were on the podium at Worlds or you won Worlds as a junior? Well, the world, the world Championship, there's a handful of amateur races that you need to win if you're going to uh, you know, take the successful leap into the professional ranks, and, and I won those. And, and so I, didn't really, I couldn't really distinguish between ego and confidence. It was just all this overwhelming sense of I can do anything. Mm-hmm. And any time I threw my leg over the motorcycle, I just I would win. And because I came to the starting line with that mindset, and I knew my skills, I knew my, you know, my ability, and I just had kind of that psychological edge over my competition. And it's an incredible place to be in, uh, and you see it with a lot of elite athletes. And when they're performing at their peak, uh, it's that zone, it's that space where they're just almost invincible. I, I, I don't want to jump ahead in the story, so we'll come back to it. But that kind of mindset gives me a glimpse or an idea of an understanding of why when you're laying in the hospital bed, you're thinking, I can do something with this, if you were even thinking that. But but it was in there, for sure. You're right. It uh, it has never left me. So going from nationals, going from feeling invincible, if I get the story right, about six months before your injury, you saw a friend who came to a race who had been injured, maybe was a quadriplegic himself. Correct. Yes. It was my first professional supercross um, here in Southern California. And I remember walking down the tunnel of the stadium Mm -hmm. just to come out onto the the racetrack. And my friend was sitting there in his wheelchair. I hadn't seen him since his accident. I had heard about it. It frightened me. But to see it, to see him face to face, uh, it, it just struck a chord in me that was really unnerving. 
And so to continue on out onto the track and to line up behind the starting line and to know that I'm racing the most difficult racetrack I'd ever been on and, mm-hmm. and to have uh, him in the back of my mind, it was, uh, it was difficult to, to get through that race. How'd the race go? Not well. Uh, had, had a couple of crashes. Um, broke. Uh, there was a mechanical failure, so I ended up um, not qualifying for the main event. Mm-hmm. So now that was uh, planting a seed, would you say? Or is it an inkling? Because that, that stayed in your mind, didn't it? Well, yeah. Th- there was some kind of elusive, ambiguous uh, thought that had I ever experienced any kind of career-ending injury, I wouldn't want to live. And so the months leading up to my accident, I, you know, any accident or crash I had, I would somehow lay on the ground and I'd wiggle my toes and just make sure I was okay and just try to brush my shoulders off, so to speak, and carry on. But there was something that was in me, some kind of knowing um, that I didn't want to accept or recognize. Oh. Before I go into the, the, the event that took place, how's your friend doing now? Um, he's still quadriplegic. We stay in touch. He's in Northern California. He works for Oracle. Yeah. He's, he's a very cool. successful guy. He's got a family. Um, he's doing well, considering the injury he lives with. Awesome. So from there, day of the injury for you, it sounds like it was a very... Maybe you could walk us through it. Surreal isn't even the right word. I don't have the right word for what was going on that day. Surreal is appropriate. Um, You know, the whole day, I remember waking up, the sun was on my face that morning, and it was just, uh, it was a really nice morning. I remember going down to the coffee shop, getting my coffee. I remember going to the race shop and kind of putzing through the shop and getting my stuff done. And, And then I ended up starting to rush through the day because I had to test the new motorcycle. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had made some modifications on it, and and I was running out of uh, out of time, and I was trying to scramble and get all my my stuff together, all my gear, my parts, and uh, my mechanic wasn't there, so I needed somebody to go with me, just to have somebody. Uh, you never ride alone. This is this is sounding out of flow. I was very out of flow. I was forcing things to happen. There were things in my day that should have kept me from riding. Mm-hmm. Uh, however, I, I made it, I remember making a conscious choice to, to grab a can of gasoline off of, uh, off the shelf that had been there for a few months Mm -hmm. and I knew that it was old gasoline and it wasn't going to be ideal, but I did it anyways. I remember distinctly filling the, the gas tank of the motorcycle with that fuel. It's like an omen. And I... The last time I was sitting there buckling my boots, I had kind of a, uh, a superstitious way of buckling, you know, my left before my right and then the gloves and the, it's a ritual when you're getting dressed, geared up. I, I get it. We talked about it on the show this past week, rituals for suiting up for performances. Yeah. It, you know, funny when you get a brand new helmet, you drop it on the ground. Uh, you're, if your gear is brand new, you get a little bit of dirt on it because you don't want to crash and, and dirty it. Um, I remember all those uh, moments vividly, and and then while I was out there testing the bike, it wasn't running well. I wasn't happy with the performance. Uh, I continued on making little adjustments, and and sure enough, um, you know, on the the largest obstacle of the track, I remember my body and the machine leading up to it, the sensations, uh, and then the moment when. The bike malfunctioned. Uh, It basically flung me over the handlebars. And I remember while in the air, I was thinking to myself, I didn't want to break my femur, the large bone in my leg. Because we wear really rigid knee braces to protect the knee. But if you're going to land on your feet from 30 feet in the air, uh, you're most likely going to break a bone in your leg. Um, and so that was like my thought as I'm flying through the air without the motorcycle and somehow I ended up over rotating and and landing on my head. And I remember that. I remember the sound that it made when my neck broke. I remember instantly like 
the light switch on the wall, you flip it off, and my body went dark, sensation, anything. I remember flopping down the backside of the of the hill and coming to coming to rest on my right side. My hand was directly in front of my face. My goggles were dusty, filled filled with dirt. And but I was extremely conscious. I was coherent. I was clear with what had happened. And there was barely a breath in my body. I was just just there. And I I remember, you know, laying amongst kind of the dirt and the, the stones that were near my hand and, and there was somehow an immediate recognition of very little difference between my body and me just being on the earth and these stones and this grass and this you know the rest of the that was a pretty profound moment for me there uh, just clinging to life to barely a breath how I'm I'm thinking to my my second experience, um, and I was bleeding out after a femur fracture, and and I stopped breathing and started to go away. How did you have the, if you did the presence, to calm yourself, so that you didn't, I imagine if you panicked, that would have been it. Yeah, there was at that point there was no I think there was some shock that had settled in. It was just so overwhelming sensory overload. No sensory. Uh there was too much to process, so all I could do was just focus on just the tiniest little breaths. And that's it. Unfortunately, you know, people that rushed to my aid, there was enough um, enough vitality in me to be able to say, please just don't touch me, uh, call the helicopter, I know my neck is broken, and, and fortunately they rushed me in, into the hospital as soon as, as, soon as they could. So you, you, you stayed awake all till they got you to the MRIs. What mm -hmm. what were you, and, and thank you for sharing because that was, wow. What what were you? Where was your mind at, and where was your heart at, at that point? Well, I was, I was really adamant about wearing my helmet all the way into <laughs> to an MRI. Somehow, I just instinctively knew, please don't take my helmet off. I knew my neck was so unstable that. If they tried to tug and pull at my helmet, that that would that would be ten times worse. Um, I, I was peaceful. Somehow, I knew that what what was going on was just right. I, I don't know how I. Um, I was just allowing the process to unfold. I wasn't fighting anything. Mm -hmm. um, I knew that I was in the right place with the doctors and clinicians there. Um, you know, the scariest part, Michael, was, was, you know, waking up after the injury or after the surgery, mm -hmm. being completely paralyzed in, in ICU and my lungs were filling with fluid. This was, this was the single most important and profound moment of my life was, was when I flatlined in ICU. And that was because of pneumonia, which is a secondary complication to high-level spinal cord injury. My body couldn't process the fluid in my, in my lungs. I couldn't clear it naturally. Uh, there was a respiratory therapist that was going to be suctioning my lungs but was called elsewhere in the hospital for, for an emergency. And, you were, and the bed was literally rotating you. It so. was rotating me side to side, yes. Um, to try to alleviate or, or prevent this. But she, she left the room and handed the suction, suction device to my father. And my dad is standing bedside and I'm just blinking at him because I'm on a ventilator. I can't speak. I can't move. Mm -hmm. I'm just literally blinking. 
and and I could hear uh, the the life support machines. I could see out of my peripheral vision my oxygen numbers dropping, and it was in a moment of struggle at first. It's like being in a straitjacket or or not being able to you know scream and nobody hear you. It's like underwater or under ice maybe mm-hmm. struggling and. And then there was this moment of real disillusion where my reality and everything that I thought and understood about life began to merge into you know, what philosophy and, and religions somewhat talk about, and that's oneness mm-hmm. or um, a vast expanse of interconnectedness. And that was my understanding in that moment where I became infinite. I became formless, timeless, like a raindrop hitting the ocean. All of a sudden I became a part of everything, pure potential. And that, in a word, simply for me is bliss. Mm -hmm. It was an incredible, um, incredibly beautiful moment that shapes who I am and what I do today. And then, uh, and then I was slammed back into this body, <laughs> you know, resuscitated me back into this, this body and, and I was able to open my eyes again mm-hmm. and I opened my eyes to my grandmother, and to my mother and, and uh, a peaceful new point of view. I, th- I would guess that puts you on a mission too. With gratitude. You know, every breath is just so miraculous. It's so incredible, the ride that we're on, the opportunity we, that we have now to to be creative in our minds and in our words and in our actions and to build, create, build, and share what is in our hearts. Mm-hmm. So that's what we're doing. Woohoo! <laughs> yeah. So you go from there, ventilator... Your your mom, if I understand right, she had been told you had a one in a million chance to even feed yourself, and she wouldn't let them tell you that. And uh, I think I think something to the effect of you will get a court order before you yeah. even get me out of this room. Yeah, yeah, she is. Uh, she's fierce. Mm-hmm. You needed that, and, and I am very fortunate to have such a ferocious mother that. Um, uh, wouldn't would stop at nothing to facilitate uh, an optimal healing environment for us, and she we got, did that nice you. She got she got music going in there, right? Yeah, right away to drown <laughs> out the sound of of, of machinery Beep. and beeps <laughs> and all those. We we had rainforest music, we had ocean sounds, we had Gregorian monk chants, we had you know the space was alive with uh with frequency vibration and humming cool mom (laughs) yeah 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 so what were they telling you and how did you start to flip that switch and i guess there's so much going on in my mind here first off i guessing ego melted away in that experience because i'm thinking back to my times that aren't anything like this i can't even compare but just the very thing that you can't poop on your own and (laughs) And you just got to let go of it all. All of it. Yeah, ego is not in the equation at all. There's no I. It was just being. I was being and I was allowing love to just flow so naturally because that's what was coming to me. My mother and, and the the people around me were just so pure, so authentic, so raw. It was. It tore down all um, all boundaries. Because there was no choice. It was just being present. I think in a sense, tell me if I'm wrong here, that's a gift to not have a choice and to just have to allow. I agree. It's a, it's a beautiful gift. It's a space where, um, you know, I think we, we beget, become a little inundated and overwhelmed with too many damn choices. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, so to be in that space of just having to 
stay so present, stay so focused and grateful. Um, yeah, I've been very lucky. That's what I say about this this injury is I wouldn't change a thing. I mean, what it's what it's allowed me um, is, I mean, not a lot of words for it. And and. and it, I- I found you, I wish I could remember the name of, of another, I believe it was another motocross athlete who found you a year into his recovery. And, and what I know from, from the forums and, and uh, comments on the web out there is how massively of a difference. There's no small, no small stone in the pond that you have dropped. <laughs> there are massive ripples from what you've done. Well, I've, I've, I guess instantaneously I knew that that all I could do all I could do was just share myself, share my love, share my time. Cuz at the end of it, I mean in that last breath, none of this other stuff matters. All all you can do with your life is give it away. Mm-hmm. Share it with each other. So that's basically all I've been doing this entire time is just sharing myself. Woohoo. <laughs> so how then as you started this recovery process, how did this go for you? Because you're a tinkerer like me. You're probably even 10 times the tinkerer that I am. And so you're, you're, you're scheming, you're planning, you're trying to figure out what am I going to do to um, get this, get this uh, uh, call it a space suit, whatever we're, we've got over us, um, going again. Well, honestly, Michael, in the beginning, um, you know, being in, in such a dire position you can't look too far ahead mm-hmm. i mean i wasn't i wasn't planning at that point i was just it, it's their their day to day moment to moment moves and you just continue working through those i couldn't even see into the next day mm-hmm. um i didn't know how long this was going to take it none of that mattered because i was so in the moment i was so present for so long um until finally I came to a, a place in my body and in life um, where I, I had built for so long the ability to, to move and function. And now I could start to like come up with ideas of how to express this. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and it came in the form of a bicycle uh, initially. Well, let me let me back you up from that though a little bit because I think there's some huge milestones here. So, first off, I'm guessing to breathe on your own was a minor huge. miracle. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, that's that's just the thing is is staying in the moment and working on one little or huge thing at a time. Mm-hmm. Uh, flickers of improvement. Uh, first, it was the ventilator. Then it was being able to sit up. Uh, assisted, mm-hmm. but to at least be vertical without passing out because my blood pressure, um, yeah. which is still an issue, um, but I've learned to control it, uh, to flickering toes, twitching shoulders and arms and fingers. Um, and I think you know the story about my sister uh, coming into the uh, the hospital room and <laughs> she, she thought she would surprise me. And, and paint my toenails with her nail polish, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of different colors, all, all the colors of the rainbow. I, I couldn't fight her. Sure, I said some things at first. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do this to me. But she did it. And I'm, I'm very happy that she did. Uh, she painted my left big toe blue and my right toe red and green and yellow and orange. And, and as I lay there in the hospital bed, I would stare at these bright colored toes and I would turn inward as I was prior. Uh, I was visualizing my body and I started to draw these colors of light through my my feet and up my legs and mm-hmm. through my torso and into my into my spinal cord right where the injury site is and I would wrap my body in these colors and I would move it through my mind and the energy flow was intense. Um, and that was the beginning of my real connection. And it was my left big toe that, that flickered first. Oh, man. How did that feel? It, was, it felt 
Right. I mean, it, <laughs> it, it was almost that, that same uh, control mm -hmm. feeling, that feeling of real confidence, like I can do this, uh, just like winning on the motorcycle. Or um, it was that immediate connection of my mind to the toe. I made that happen. I'd be thinking, gotcha. <laughs> there it is. And immediately I looked around and I made sure everybody saw what was happening. Yeah. I said, look, I'll do it again. Did it again. So at that point, I began to show off. Why not? <laughs> so you – oh, go, go for it. No, it's just they're, they were huge. You know, Although it was such a minute little, little uh, improvement, it was, it was worth celebrating. It's huge, and you just did something that many have said, many have said, the whole medical establishment has said, is impossible. You started rewiring. Rewiring and firing. Yes. And, and you did it through visualization and color and light. This is just amazing. That's, at the end of it all, isn't that what it is? <laughs> That's all that there is, yes. So, so we fast forward through the process how did it feel? I, I'm remembering my experience because this is the only thing I have to base it on, and it, it, it's not even close. But I remember when they first lowered me into water. They took me from a wheelchair and put me into a, this chair contraption and dropped me into water, sure. which actually scared the hell out of me. <laughs> how, how did it feel the first time you went into water, and was that like a liberating experience? Well, I understand the the, the fear part because. If they let you go, you're going to sink. <laughs> I was, yeah, that even happens to me still because I don't swim very well. I sink well. Mm -hmm. So I've got to know where the bottom is. Yep. Um, but it was actually, it felt really natural. Uh, I'm an Aquarius. I love the water. Yep. Um, and the, the absence of gravity, so to speak, allowed those little flickers of movement to be exaggerated to actual... Um, much larger gross motor movement. So when they were doing rehab with you, were you working yourself? Were you, I'm guessing you took your pro athlete attitude and sense of uh, training and brought that to everything. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Those, those fundamentals that I learned from being an athlete apply everywhere in my life, but never more so than than in that in the recovery process and i would actually work the therapist I mean, you have to engage feeling. the process and I, I see that all too often a lot of times where you know clients or patients are going through the emotions mm -hmm. and the therapist is you know taking them through the range of motion and doing the exercises and what have you but you've got to engage the process i was so hyper engaged um, that I was working the therapist. And when they were done, I would push for more. Awesome, awesome. And what was your mom doing at that time? Right there with me. Cheerleading it, facilitating it, making sure that, that uh, you know, I was prepped and ready. Mm -hmm. We were on time for our treatments. I was well-nourished. My space was, was um, you know, beautiful and serene and, and conducive to this regeneration. I mean, it was a clean slate that we're building from. We're not trying to go back. Yeah. We're moving forward. That's a key concept. Can you explain more about that? Yeah, I see that a lot as well, Michael, where people are trying to get back to what was. Mm -hmm. And, you know, life is about moving forward and evolving yourself. And the body, you know, naturally regenerates itself many times over throughout your lifetime and somehow you know I, I'm not a I wasn't a student of the body at that time I, I hadn't studied uh, anatomy or you know um, uh, the biomechanics of the body but I just understood that I'm creating new and if everything about my body and my future is just brand new mm -hmm. and I'm the co-creator of this I'm going to be manifesting uh, my intentions. This all came very um, naturally to me. And so I never spent time or energy trying to look back and go, oh, I can't wait to get back on the motorcycle. Oh, I'm going to get back to my life that was. 
It was all now moving forward, a new creation. So also there wasn't time for, or there wasn't room for regret. No. There was no, no time or room. Did uh, laughter come into the equation at all, humor? At times, yes. I think uh, definitely a spice of life. Um, those were intense times. I used a lot of, uh, some of my friends would come in and, and we would laugh and play a little bit. Um, I was extremely focused. I would use anger, you know, um, as a very powerful fuel because you can imagine at 20 years old, life shifting in such a way mm -hmm. um, that, you know, of course, it's like I've, I've, I've been given this opportunity to see and feel and, and create, you know, through this experience, but I'm also devastated as a young, young person. And I didn't have an outlet for that. And so my outlet became, you know, the hard ass work that I was doing. And it was very intense. They give you a set of 10, you're going, let's do 100? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> so you get to a year. A year in, where were you? Uh, I was in an electric wheelchair. My mother was doing my bowel and bladder for me, mm -hmm. uh, feeding, uh, at least helping me eat. Um, you know, my body was, was firing. I was starting to twitch a lot of things. I was starting to have gross motor movement. I was, um, you know, able to regulate blood pressure, and I was just getting fired up. You know, to me, that was just the beginning uh, but but insurance thought otherwise. Yeah, um, I was I was discharged and there was really no place to go. My mom was looking for different places around the country, ongoing rehab. Um, very very few and far between uh, opportunities. Uh, but but I was kind of going downhill fast psychologically because uh, too much idle time mm -hmm. in my body. If I stopped doing the work progresses incredibly fast. Uh, so I became uh, real dark. A space that uh, is, is frightening mm -hmm. because uh, it doesn't matter who's around you or what is said or what's presented at that space of, of despair. Nothing was... Nothing was working, and, and I really wanted to to end that. How, what, what started to get you through? By going through it, I guess. Mm. Allowing myself to be at the edge of a swimming pool. Allowing myself to reflect... To see my reflection. <laughs> and, and, and by going to the end of the swimming pool, you mean literally taking your electric chair to the edge of the swimming pool? Yeah, yeah. Because that was my only means at that time. I couldn't, I couldn't drive anything. I couldn't you know, pull a trigger. I couldn't open a pill bottle. I, you know, I had no control over anything. Mm -hmm. um, allowing myself to go through that space, allowing... Um, my mother to continue facilitating uh, and just loving me and I didn't resist going to the California State Northridge where she uncovered uh, my now business partner He back then he was a professor of kinesiology and he was kind of pioneering uh, some groundbreaking work with spinal cord injury and mm -hmm. And, and one day she, she scooped me up and I, I can't resist. You know, she <laughs> literally scooped me up. And we're um, going. <laughs> yep. And 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 we wheeled into into his office and and that was kind of a light bulb aha moment where, you know, if imagine, you know, watching a a, a film in black and white and then all of a sudden it turns to color. 
uh, I came through those doors and the carpet was red and the facility was wall to wall with all this incredible machinery that I had never seen, exercise equipment, and this tall, lean South African soccer player comes around the corner and says, you know, together we can do some incredible things. Um, and there is opportunity here, and that's where, that's where it all came together. And I went, yeah, all right, we can do it here. And I didn't look left or right or even lift my head for the next three years. Your, your mom gets the hero of the, I don't know what, hero of the millennium. I can't, because it's an absolute miracle she found him. It's an absolute miracle financially to make it through this situation. I'm sure that's no small thing to say. She was willing to do anything and everything. We liquidated all assets. Um, you know, we didn't leave any stone unturned. She, she really went to the ends of the earth for me. And fortunately, it wasn't too far away. <laughs> I, I was already on the edge, and the edge was right there. And, and uh, that's where, uh, where magic began, began to happen. Woohoo! <laughs> so from there, you spend three years in tenth rehab. Is it is it uh, Taylor or Doctor Taylor? Or? It's Taylor Kevin Isaacs. Yes. Okay. With a lot of letters behind it. <laughs> so you spent three years working with Taylor, and how are you doing at the end of that time? Well, it, I mean, by the time two thousand three came around, I was on the back of a tandem bicycle. So you you got to tell me about this, and your mom was on the front of the tandem. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, you know, like like you've said before, there's a lot of little milestones in that period of time, you know, uh, that Taylor and I set and achieved. Um, but you know, it really started to to get big time when the tandem bicycle came into my reality, and that was uh, something I noticed that was hanging on the wall in the gym. Yeah, were these funny looking bicycles? They were just really long and awkward looking, and I'd never seen one before. And but I saw that there was a back seat, and I thought, you know what, that's, uh, that's, that's, I can do that. You know, I know I can get on the back of that thing. And, and my mom, being the superwoman that she is, she just said, well, hell, I'll ride it with you. <laughs> and, and so we started, you know, testing it. And, and then that, uh, that natural instinct for me, you know, the, the tinkerer, the kind of the engineer mm -hmm. uh, mindset, um, I started to really look at that bike and, and figure out for myself how is it really going to work. And that's where uh, I started to get excited about what I could do with my recovery. Because in, in the beginning, it's just such a, such a broad, um, overwhelming task to recover. So what does that mean? I mean, I'm doing so much work to recover what? You know, every part of my body is, is affected. And I needed specific targets to work towards. Mm -hmm. You know, like in the beginning, the specific target was a toe. And then it starts to, you know, like building with Legos, you know, you now you've got a lot to work with. So now I need to get specific. And so that tandem bicycle was that target. And and mom and I got on that thing and I could barely sit for a few minutes at first. Uh, we pedaled our first mile. And I mean, these things were huge. And it was just she and I, you know, we're out there uh, at a local park on a bike path, you know, hooting and hollering and high-fiving each other yep. like it's some huge event, but it's just, a, you know, like a Tuesday. But it must have felt amazing. Oh, it did. The wind in my face, um, you know, the sun on our back, pretty special. Every one of those rides, and, it, and it, you give everything to that process. Every pedal stroke is hard-ass work. Um, you know, and she wasn't very much of a cyclist before that, but she became one hell of a rider. So when did the idea, and whose idea was it, of a let's ride across the country? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, after we had done a couple of L.A. marathons, mm -hmm. which is 26.2 miles, those were massive achievements. You know, we trained really, really hard for those. And um, I, we were we were on stage one day giving a clinical presentation with Taylor, the three of us, yep. mom, Taylor, and me. 
And I guess we were wrapping up the presentation. We were talking about the tandem bike, and, and Forrest Gump popped into my head, and I thought, you know what? We've done these LA marathons, and I'm mm-hmm. looking over at her. I'm like, I mean, we're riding this thing. We may as well just ride it across the country. And I looked at her, and she looked at me like I was nuts, and the audience was like, yes, and approval. <laughs> and uh, so that was where the seed for that was planted, and it took us three years to develop that tour. But what a what a carrot to get you going, to get you healing. And I imagine, I, I don't know the finances behind it, but if you can get backing to do the tour, that had to start help writing the ship, at least getting you through. Yeah, I mean, that was an incredible, you know, the proverbial carrot. It was an incredible target for me to work towards. And, and then to start applying, you know, what I had learned uh, with developing a racing career. Mm-hmm. I started writing proposals. Yeah, um, you know, I was self-taught in web design and became savvy with the computer. And I was reaching out to old sponsors and new sponsors and and pitching this idea. And of course, everybody thought we were nuts. I mean, to ride the, across the country is one thing, but to do it as a recovering quadriplegic is a whole different deal. So it was hard to get people uh, on board. Mm-hmm. And that's why it took three years because we would put a target date out there and that, we'd, that date would come and go because it wasn't all aligning. And finally on that third year, it all just fell into place perfectly. The team came together. The sponsors came together. The support vehicle, my body was on point. And we set off from San Diego, California, headed east and pedaled. 3,182 miles across the southern tier of the United States to St. Augustine, Florida. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> it was an incredible, incredible trip. And I'm guessing, well, what was the hardest thing, and then did you come out of it stronger? Well, yeah. Uh, ultimately, I came out of it stronger. Um, uh, the hardest thing, I suppose, was managing the team on the bus we were in a you know in a tour bus and there were seven of us uh, i was rotating between my mother and my two best friends mm-hmm. uh, because i was wearing them out on the front of the bike i was always on the back but somebody had to keep you know uh keep steering the thing yep and um managing the heat uh my body in the heat i don't uh, thermoregulate very well so sweating in 110 or 115 degrees across, you know, parts of Texas and Louisiana, um, managing the risk involved, uh, sitting on a bike seat for that many hours in the day is is difficult and hard on the body. We're not we're not made to weight bear on, uh, on seats like that. Uh, but at the end of it, when we hit the sand in St. Augustine. My body was just alive and primed for more. And at that point, I said, forget the back seat, man. I said, <laughs> I'm, I'm strong enough to pedal my own bike. And, mm-hmm. and uh, that's where we, I said, I'll rest for a couple months, but then I've got to put this thing in motion again. We had all the components for another tour, and I wanted to do it on my own this time. So we did. So tell us about briefly about the trike, because it's cool. <laughs> The trike, yeah, the trike was something that I had been eyeballing uh, for for a little while. There was a there's a big trike kind of association in Belgium and in England. Um, it's more of an aristocratic type oh, bicycle. And, and they race those things, though. Yeah, yeah, they race them there. Uh, it was back in the day. The trikes were the were the uh, you know the premier machine. Mm-hmm. So they keep that tradition alive over there. Uh, and and I. I reached out to the builder. I had him build me a conversion axle uh, to some specs that I, I had. I then married that up to a race bike, mm-hmm. like a, a carbon fiber frame. And that was the beginning. That was my first edition of the tricycle. I, I debuted it at the 2008 um, LA Marathon. Yeah. Barely made it through the marathon. I was, I was wrecked. By the end, because I'd never pedaled on my own. Solo. You wait a second. You debuted it for yourself. Yeah. You tested it in a race. Yeah. Holy smokes! (laughs) Well, I don't know. In my mind, I thought, 
well, I just ridden, you know, over three thousand miles. I could easily <laughs> pedal twenty six, but I, I was I was smoked. Um, but at the end of that, I thought, okay, well, that, I've got this. I, I can just tweak the machine. I can get my sponsors on board. We've got the tour bus. We've got everything in motion. I went back to the the drawing board logistically with my route, um, and it all fell into place really quickly. And we ended up leaving on the same date um, as we did the prayer year, uh, June tenth, two thousand eight, mm-hmm. from San Francisco. And I pedaled the trike with now mom riding her own bicycle next to me. Very cool. And it was just she and I that pedaled uh, 4,202 miles across all the mountain ranges through the middle of uh, the United States called the Trans-America Trail, mm-hmm. uh, right to uh, the steps of the White House in D.C. Woo! <laughs> oh, my God. I can imagine because I've I done a, uh, uh, a similar journey, started in the northwest down to the bay and then up and across and over to D.C. myself. And uh, that is beyond no small feat. That was epic. That was a real epic journey. Uh, I think I enjoyed that the most. Going from there, can you tell us about your epic journey in the Sahara? Uh, God, Sahara and Death Valley. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you just planted a seed. Huh? <laughs> no, <laughs> you've got <laughs> enough seeds. I know it. <laughs> Um, Death Valley. Well, yeah, flash forward. Um, well, flash forward with the trike, mm-hmm. uh, the Paralympic um, uh, uh, kind of um, training came calling. I started racing the mm-hmm. trike. I won a couple or a national championship and participated in a bunch of events. My target was London Paralympics. Um, I fell just short of making the, the games uh, because of a bladder infection two days before the race. Wow. Uh, but that was okay. That kind of closed the chapter on the tricycle for me. So you were um, at peace. Because this is, this is an important concept, is how much you've been at peace through the whole process. Yeah. Yeah. What, what I'm doing is I'm just, I'm exploring, you know, my, my potential, you know, my body's potential, my mind's potential. I'm, I'm pushing myself forward and, and finding the kind of the limits of my ability to create and, and um, make things happen. And so with the tricycle, I couldn't just stop after the tour. I needed to just see how far I could go with that bike and what I could accomplish with it. And, you know, the, para, the Olympics um, is like the, the pinnacle. Mm-hmm. And so that was my target. And, and that was 2012. So, you know, as we ended the 2008 tour, I just trained for those, those years leading up and, incredible what I learned with that group of, of coaches and athletes and that whole system. Um, I explored the depths of my mind and, and how far I could, I could push myself, how I could manage that kind of energy output, that kind of training on, on a level like I'd never known. Mm-hmm. Sleeping in a hyperbaric chamber, you know, training altitude. Yep. Two, two, three times a day. Um, the amount of time and, and energy put on that bike or put out with that bike is amazing. So when I didn't make the games, uh, I was okay. I was like, okay, well, this is how far I've come. And this is my body needs to change. Before, uh, because I, before go we go, go there, I, I just, I want to wrap my mind around this for our audience, because I think one of the most powerful things that you just shared right now, and I think we can all learn from, is rather than be focused on the outcome to be an explorer of our own reality of whatever we're doing and just see. Yeah, yeah I say that Mike, when I talk about this. I, the, the journey in, that I went through with the goal of the Olympics um, is relatable for people. The Olympics themselves is not relatable. A, a medal that I was, you know, on paper looked like I could achieve it's not relatable. So, you know, we, we, a, a lot of us set goals for ourselves and they don't pan out the way we had hoped or wanted. But that's not the point. The point is you've got you've to put one foot in front of the other, so to speak, and be willing to go through that and recognize that process as valuable and incredible. Uh, absorb 
uh, what you learn in the highs and lows mm -hmm. of that process. So, you know, when, when the bladder infection happened and when I didn't get on the airplane to go, uh, I sent my coaches the photo from the emergency room and said, hey, this is it. My body's telling me this is, you've got to shift gears, you've got to start uh, something else. And so that's where this whole desert walk uh, became relevant to me. I needed to get back to functional movements, um, focus on walking, focus on posture, focus on functional strength. I became a very proficient cyclist, but at the, um, you know, uh, at, at the cost of, of walking uh, well. So I thought, okay, um, I can walk on flat surfaces pretty well. I can traverse up and over, you know, uh, hills and, and slight mountains. Mm -hmm. And uh, I developed this this kind of shopping cart buggy thing because one day when I was in the shopping or in the in the grocery store, I was pushing the the, the shopping cart and it was really windy outside. Yep. And it wasn't affecting me while I hold the cart. If I walk with my cane, the wind can affect me pretty bad. And so I thought, okay, I can push something like this long distance. And and for people, if you if if you if you haven't seen this, it, to me, it looks like uh, one of the trike baby strollers. Well, that's exactly what it is, Mike. It's, uh, <laughs> I went on Craigslist and I was searching around and found uh, a used giant bicycle built mm -hmm. jogging stroller. It had brakes. It had yep. suspension. I put off-road tires on it. Perfect. Um, got the thing. I, I kind of cut it up and, and added my own little features to it. I put a solar panel on it, um, carried all my own water, mm -hmm. all my supplies, and set off across Death Valley. I kind of, just like I did with my, my tours, I mapped the route and uh, did a lot of my, my research about uh, making sure I had some outs. I've always got to make sure there's a safety out for me. I don't want to go in there and, you know, blind risk. How solo were you for it? It was just me and a filmmaker, Dominic Gill. Dom Gill thought uh, he would love to document that mm -hmm. and, and capture me doing this and so to me that was just peace of mind knowing that if I did get in a lot of trouble that at least he could drag me out of there yeah he's he's kind of like a bear grills he's a real hardy uh you know savvy outdoorsman so that was great for me to be able to go and and uh make this happen how much are you using visualization to go through this process always Always, I, I visualize my movement. I, it's a conscious effort for me to make things happen. Um, it's uh, every step, every movement, I am willing it to happen. Mm -hmm. you know, um, and so, to, so whether it, it, the, the difficulty for me to do things is the same, whether I'm getting dressed or I'm walking across the desert. It's the same amount of effort. It's the same thought process. It's the same engagement. So I just, you know, uh, extrapolate that over a long period of time, and I and I learned how to manage that. Mm -hmm. I like that because it makes me think when we're when and kind of a theme here is for anyone that we can we can do the quote unquote impossible, is that you've got you you're going to have to manage whatever you do so you can manage doing somebody else's dream or whatever it is, or you can manage your own. It's probably, in a sense, the same amount of energy. In fact, if you're doing your own, you draw in more energy. Yeah, and at the end of the day, when you lay down and you go, wow, I'm building my own thing, it, you, you feel very, uh, it's very special. So let's fast forward from there because we're, we're getting a little bit short on time. I just, I just, this is just an amazing, you've done some amazing things Talk to us, and, and, and I guess one last thing on that trip is you just helped work on your blood pressure. You helped work on your stability, blood pressure, um, heat management, even started building bone density by giving yourself this challenge. The desert walk, yes. Yeah. I mean, that, that made me uh, incredibly strong on my feet, uh, my posture, uh, my circulation, bone density improved, the firing in certain musculature to create balance in my body, uh, you know, the space of, I, I had to be very peaceful through that whole process. You can't get into a frantic mode out there because there's no, I mean, 
yes, I had an out, but not really. I mean, you're out there. You've got to stay poised and and uh, harmonic with the environment that you're in. How do you do that? Gratitude, man. All right. <laughs> I was there. I was there, and, you know, it's just the stars and the earth. And uh, everything... Everything was just so connected. I was so in tune. Mm -hmm. the, the subtle sounds and the, the wind and the smells and the—that's uh, a space that I really thrive in. So I, I uh, just amplified that energy in my body to make it happen and make it work. You just felt the connection. I, I don't have the words yeah. for it. The connection. Yeah, really connected. I was just incredibly connected out there. So let's let's go from there and then let's talk because when we talk about building things, you have built something really special here with Taylor called Core. Well, the the cornerstone of this thing is my mother, for sure. She is the the rock. Yeah. The bedrock of it all. And she and I um were the ones that that decided to pull the trigger on cord. We just said, Taylor, you're coming with us. And, you know, it was, it was mom and I that saved our pennies and, and uh, did all the, the research and all the legwork to basically uh, make the investment ourselves. And said, Taylor, come in and, and do what you've done with me, with other people. We'll build a framework around it. We'll bring in other staff, and we're going to begin training the staff under your methodology. And we sat and, and have been developing our own curriculum and our own uh, uh, TKI system of function mm -hmm. through this process. We're in our fifth year, um, Center of Restorative Exercise. We're right here in Northridge, California. And we're able to provide a space, literally a door for people to come through and improve the quality of their life if they choose. Because I remember not having a choice at that point. And I know the power of this place because I, I live it and I use it every day. I love it. And it speaks also to the power of visualization and what you think about you'll bring about. Because it sounds like you were talking about it for years before it existed as if it was already there. Yeah, positive outcome uh, affirmations, uh, thoughts. Uh, on the bicycle tours, we had the concept of core mm -hmm. back then. It was on paper. It looked great. We were promoting it and talking about it to uh, rehab hospitals and, and communities, and we basically validating if we brought this into reality, would it live? Mm -hmm. And we everywhere we went, it was just so well received and said, "Please, yes, we would love to have a core in our community." And so when we got done with the tours, we thought, "Oh, we've got to push this thing forward." Yeah. So from there, just a, a few more things we'll talk about, then we'll, we'll start to wrap things up. How'd you meet your wife? I had a wedding. <laughs> I, uh, I crashed a wedding. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I was friends with the groom, and she was friends with the bride. And yeah. We'd never met before. We'd kind of heard about each other, I guess. And, and I showed up uh, and just spotted her you know, across the way on the dance floor. And I thought, wow, she's something something special, something I hadn't seen before. Mm -hmm. um, and a couple days later, I had arranged with the newlyweds to do a little double date. Very nice. So uh, went out to a little Mexican food, and mm -hmm. that's it. The rest is history. It, it is amazing. So have you had uh, opportunities to dance with her? At our wedding, <laughs> yes. At our wedding uh, this past September, mm -hmm. um, we we had dance lessons and the first dance was pretty incredible. Woohoo! And I've yeah. seen her. I seen her just in this video. I was just looking at. There was an event that you just did. Maybe you can tell us about that. Yeah! Wow! That we're. I'm just decompressing from this event. It's called the uh, Wings for Life World Run. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's founded by Red Bull. It's uh, specifically for spinal cord injury research. Uh, in finding a cure for spinal cord injury. They are leading 
away with uh, awareness and fundraising for this cause. The World Run is a global event where 34 countries around the world simultaneously begin running uh, a race. Whether you run, walk, or roll, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. The point is everybody leaves the starting line at the same time. And in our time zone on the West Coast, it happens to be at 4 a.m. <laughs> um, <Brutal. laughs> and, and so uh, 30 minutes into the race, there begins a catcher car mm -hmm. starting to follow everybody that is synced to the, the network um, so that when it catches and passes you, your race is up. And so I, uh, I was walking. I walked uh, for 32 minutes in the race. I was um, honoring a friend of mine who just last week, um, pretty newly injured. Uh, he was a quadriplegic. He had a lot of potential. His body was, was beginning to come online, so mm -hmm. to speak. But, you know, the, there's no reprieve from this injury Michael, it's very difficult to deal with psychologically, and and my friend Bobby couldn't couldn't deal with that, and he decided to to take that plunge, and uh, took his own life, and it's it's understandable because of difficulties, but it's still not easy on his family and his friends and the community at large. So I was I was walking on behalf of Bobby yeah. in that event. And hopefully, you know, we can show the rest of the world that there is hope and there are things to be extremely excited about. Uh, we will have a cure for spinal cord injury one day. And with organizations like Red Bull and Wings for Life, um, we're just getting that much closer every day. And you are, there aren't even words to describe what you've done. I am you. <laughs> I am you. I am a reflection of the most beautiful parts of being human, our spirit. We're very lucky. Thank you. Thank you. With that said, a few last wrap-up things. First off, do you want to give a shout-out to your sponsors? Yeah, I have, I have a few um, incredible uh, companies and people that stand behind me that have been with me for quite a while. Fox Racing, mm -hmm. I really appreciate everything that they've done. Todd Hicks. Um, core centers, of course. You know that's uh, that's uh, everything that I do. Um, love to thank uh, Wings for Life, uh, that organization, and everything that they're doing globally for mm -hmm. spinal cord injury. Christopher and Dana Reeves Foundation, Triumph Foundation, Life Holds On Foundation, um, uh, Rock Racing. They keep me on those wheels. Uh, reactive adaptations with my mountain bike that I'm. Doing a lot of riding these days. That that I can't even watch those videos. My stomach just seeing you going down <laughs> Mammoth. My stomach just flipped in two, and I'm like, too much. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of fun. I love getting out there, out into the wild. So, I appreciate my sponsors. I appreciate the people that stand behind us, and uh, hopefully, I continue to make them proud. Fantastic. So, where can people go to find out more and uh, to find Core? You can, uh, you can find CORE at uh, the Center of Restorative Exercise .com. Mm -hmm. I know that's a mouthful. Um, you can find me at I'm Aaron Baker .com. All the social media, it's all the same. I'm, Bar I'm Aaron Baker .com and mm -hmm. I'd love to, uh, love to hear from you. Then uh, thank you. Two, two quick wrap-up questions. First off, people like your friend who are going through this or going through something like this or going through their own, for lack of another term, dark night of the soul, uh, what would you tell them? I would say don't deny it. Don't, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a natural part of being human to feel both elation and despair. Uh, this is hard. No, no two ways about it. I'm not uh, going to sugarcoat this thing and be the uber positive guy all the time and just be like, you know, oh, it's a, such an amazing uh, process. You, you've got to feel, you know, the the contrast. Allow the people cl closest to you to love you, to, to help you. You know, drop pride and ego. Allow people to catalyze around you. Uh, get involved. 
with some of these amazing things. Just show up. You know, you may not be super excited to go, but just show up. Like if, if Bobby would have waited two days and showed up to this thing this weekend, mm-hmm. it would have been a shift in his psyche because the, the, the energy is so palpable. It's so intense. There's so much to be excited about. He would have lasted a bit longer, I think. Um, be willing to walk through the fire. Thank you. Thank you. So what personally, a question we like to ask just before the end, brings you the greatest happiness or what we call the woohoo factor? Uh, when I'm really connecting with people, Michael, when I'm sharing one-on-one, if I'm out in nature, doing something with somebody that they've never thought possible or never done before, being completely peaceful and connected, I just vibrate with... Uh, just gratitude you know I'm really alive and I'm really grateful awesome awesome any last words wisdom you want to share with people go out there and share all of yourself your time and your love at the end of the day it's all we have thanks (laughs) thank you so much Aaron thank you for being on the show we love you we support your work let us know if there's anything we can do to help For everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, take that one in a million shot and put that one foot in front of the other and shine bright. Woohoo! Cool, man. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments. Have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're going to get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, inspirenationshow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else, and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>